Well, so thought that it would be helpful to review some things. Um, last week we reviewed Millennium, this week Ecclesiastes. Now, do you remember how many chapters there are in Ecclesiastes? How many, Eliza? Twelve chapters. That means we were there about 12 weeks. Now, if you're like me, you don't remember much of it. It's just hard to remember. You know, you're, you're learning things here. And so a little bit of review sometimes helps. Like you come back to it a few months later, you go over like, oh, that's right. And it kind of sinks maybe a little bit deeper because the goal here is not just to say, oh, I studied it or I learned something new. The point is that it stays enough in your, in your consciousness that the truths are impacting how you're reacting to the world, how you're reacting to the things that happen to you. The hope is that these truths that we've discovered, when, when circumstances happen, when things feel out of control, when we're worried about something, when we're anticipating something, we're reminded of truth. And it is like ballast to our faith no matter what happens. So we've spent about you know, three months studying it, and my goal was to revisit it and summarize some things. It, I don't know if I'm going to do a very good job. How do you ex- summarize all... 12 chapters, there's so many good things there, but this is kind of at 30,000 feet level, trying to understand it. To to get us thinking about it um, and how truth relates, just just imagine, if if I could have handed you out a little index card and every one of you and given you five minutes to fill it in, I want you to think, just think for a second how you might have answered this. So think, think about 2022. Are you excited? Apprehensive? Weary? Something else? Why? Just think, on a human emotion, the things that have been percolating, 2022, am I looking forward to it? Something worrying me? Am I dreading it in some way? Don't, don't, have I not even thought about it at all? What is it? So, some of you are natural born worriers, and you've probably thought about this a fair amount. <laughs> You've, you've already come up with several bad scenarios of what could happen in 22. Um, I'm suspecting you're more apprehensive. You don't have much to look forward to. Um, and you're the kind of person that probably thinks, well, if, it probably won't be as bad as I think it is, then I'll be pleasantly surprised, but <laughs> we prepare for the worst. And then, then there's the people that are just optimistic. They tend to be uh, the, those extroverts, optimistic. The kids, yeah, you're looking forward to like, it's going to be a great year. <laughs> um, that's good, too. Um, it's funny. Well, don't say that. <laughs> the worrier says, no, 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 you, you do not understand. Um, and, and, I, and I suspect there's people that haven't thought about it at all. They're just like, it's just another week, it's just another month, it's just another, I'm just busy doing this stuff. Okay. Um, but if I set this in front of you and I really said, I want you to write something down, probably because you're a Christian, because you've been attending church, because we've been talking about the Bible a lot, I think in your mind somewhere you'd start to say, well, yeah, if I'm honest, I'm worried about this, but I know that God tells me not to be worried. Or you say, well, I know I'm looking forward to doing this, but I know I can't depend on that because God says, if the Lord will. So, so you're placing those biblical truths in there, and that's, that's right. That's what we're supposed to be doing. So let's try to do that now with Ecclesiastes. It's a text, a book given to us so that there's truth, so that when we look forward to the coming year or don't look forward to the coming year, there's something that helps us get through it in an encouraging right way. Now, you you were supposed to have read through Ecclesiastes again this week, and Hopefully, you experienced again, reading chapter 1 and 2, where it's like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to seek out pleasure, make a legacy for myself. And he says, it's all vanity. It's all meaning. It's all whatever your translation said. And you realize that at a human level, we can make plans, but where's God in this whole picture? So, let's try to think again through Ecclesiastes. Here's a guy who had plans. Here's a guy who was seeking out pleasure, seeking out a legacy, trying to do what he wants to do. And yet, what's it all about? And in the end of the book, where Ella just read, it says, this is the whole duty of man. Or 
some of your translations were more accurate and said, this is everything to a person, or this is man's all. It's to fear God and keep his commands. That's it. That's the book. So you were supposed to read through the book this week. Did you find anywhere that talked about fearing God? Because that's what you're supposed to look at. That's what the book says it's about. Did you find anywhere that talked about fearing God? Chapter five. Chapter five. Okay, where else? 314 and one other place? 812. So there's three places. So I got them highlighted here. Um, here's the end of the matter. All has been heard. Fear God. And there's three little dots there. Now, if you're a biblical interpreter and you've read the end, okay, he said, this is what the book's about, fearing God. And now in three passages it mentioned fearing God. Does that seem like an overwhelming case for the books about fearing God? It doesn't really feel that way. So we're going to have to think through this. Why does he say this is what the book's about when it only mentioned fearing God three times? Now let's, let's look at these three times quickly, just to review. You guys read through it, but, but here they are. Fear God. He says in chapter 3, I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it or anything taken away from it. God has done it so that people fear before him. Next place, in chapter 5. Um, he's been talking about offering a sacrifice to God. Uh, For when dreams increase and words have grown many, there is vanity. But God is the one you must fear. So instead of following your own desires, God's the one you must fear. Okay, good point. Chapter 8. Though a sinner does evil a hundred times and prolongs his life, yet I know that it will be well with those who fear God because they fear before him. So because they're fearing him, it's going to go well with them. But it will not be well with the wicked. Neither will he prolong his days like a shadow because he does not fear before God. That's, that's good stuff. But it's three little verses or three little passages in 12 chapters. Um, would have you said, had you read the whole book, would you say this book is about fearing God if that's all you saw about the fearing part? I probably wouldn't have picked that. So I've got to understand the logic that the interpreter thought it necessary to tell us, this is my point. This is my point. So let's try to figure out why was this his point. Now, fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the old duty of man. For, and he gives us the reason, fear God, keep his commandments, this is everything to a person. This is about being a human. For, here's the reason, God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Oh, so maybe, maybe there's a lot about God judging. Is there a lot about God judging in this book? Are you remembering it? Are you thinking now, oh, I maybe should listen to the, the text a little bit more? <laughs> yeah, because you've got to review here. This, it just goes in one ear out the other. And this is hard to remember, so let's review. So here it is. Those are the judgment places. Those little red dots. Four places. You can notice um, at three of them, they're really close to the fear in God part, which would make sense. He's connected them in each case. Here, here let's just look at a couple of them. God will bring every deed into judgment. I said in my heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time for every matter and every work. God will judge. First time it's mentioned. Chapter 5. Let not your mouth lead you into sin, and do not say before the messenger that it was a mistake. You're offering a sacrifice. You said, I'm going to go a good sacrifice to God. If he does this, he does it. The messenger from the temple comes and says, where's the sacrifice you promised? You go like, oh, actually, I, I didn't really mean that. Uh, no, don't do that. Why should God be angry at your voice and destroy the work of your hands? doesn't use the word judge, but there's a judgment there, so I included it. Chapter 8. Though a sinner does evil a hundred times and prolongs his life, yet I know it will be well with those who fear God because they fear before him. But it will not be well with the wicked. Neither will he prolong his life like a shadow because he does not fear before God. Okay, it doesn't use the word judgment, but it's clearly it's going to be well or not well. That seems to be a judgment, so I included it. Um, and then one other time, we actually uses the word judgment. Rejoice, O young man, in your youth. Let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and the sight of your eyes. But know that for all these things God will bring into judgment. So, here's the whole of the book. Fear God, keep his commandments because you're going to be judged for it. And then he's said this three different places. Does that seem like an adequate summary of the book now? Are you seeing the problem? Does it feel like a problem to you? It feels like a little bit of a problem. It seems like a minor point he's made in 12 chapters, not a major point. 
So what is more the major thing? The question I think that is helpful to ask at this point is, okay, I'm supposed to fear God because he's going to judge me. What does that say about God? Even if, even if it's just told God will judge, what, what is the author now presupposing about God if he's the one we should fear and judge? What is it presupposing? Anything come to your mind? He's an authority, okay. He's in control, right. So those are kind of the things that start to come to mind. So now let's go back and look at the text and ask, does Ecclesiastes talk about God very much? Does Ecclesiastes talk about God very much? Now, this was the thing that probably struck me the most when I was studying this several months ago. I, one of the first jobs I, I did, I assigned myself was go through the book and just start noticing all the times God is mentioned. I didn't think he was mentioned very much. It turns out he's mentioned quite a bit. Look at all those purple spots. He's mentioned quite a bit what God will or won't do. Now, we're not going to look at all of them, but I start to see that. And I'm like, oh, well, what does it say about God? Here's a few of the things that it says about God. For God will do something. Here, he has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. In other words, you and I want to know what's going to happen. You and I want to fit the pieces together. You and I want to say this happened, and then therefore this will happen, or I see God did this, so I know this, I know what God's plan is. We want to know it, but we can't. And God does it precisely so that we would know he is in control, not us. Chapter 7, just another one I picked that says about the same thing. Consider, he says, the work of God. Who can make straight what he has made crooked? In the day of prosperity, be joyful. In the day of adversity, consider, God has made one as well as the other, so that man may not find out anything that will be after him. God is in control. He is choosing what he will do, whether good or evil in your eyes. He is doing both. God is doing it so that you know you're not him. So that you know you can't do what he can do. He is much different. He is in a class all of his own. Chapter 8. Then I saw all the work of God. That man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun. However much man may see toil in seeking, he will not find it out. Even though a wise man claims to know, he cannot find it out. You go through the Ecclesiastes and ask, what does it say about God? What is he doing? And over and over again, God's supremacy, his sovereignty, his ability to do whatever he wants to do rises quickly and high to the surface. So here's Solomon, who spends the first two chapters going, ah, what, what am I going to get from all this work I'm going to do? And he says, I think I'm going to look for pleasure, and I'm going to look for legacy. And he realizes at some point, I've left God out of the picture, and that's a foolish of me. And so he starts to think about how does God relate to humanity, and he realizes God's work is nothing like my work. God does whatever he wants. He's the sovereign God who is in mysterious control, and I can't figure it out. But he is watching. He is active. He's not a deist. He's not apart from me. He's very much involved. So God knows what he's about. That's, that's the life-giving truth I'm going to pull from this overall in Ecclesiastes. God knows what he's about. Now, with that as the starting point, it makes sense to say, fear him. If he's the one that's really in control, if he's the one that's got a plan, if he's the one that's got a plan and judging us, and he's given us commandments. Now, that word commandment is not used anywhere else in this book. So you have to look at what are the things that God does give us or assign to us, and you can extrapolate from there. What's he thinking about with commands? Okay, let's move on. We'll, we'll come back to that question. 
Okay, now you remember the big word here is vanity, right? Used 37 times. Does anybody remember what the word vanity um, means? What the, what the original word is and what it means? Because vanity is not a real good translation. It means breath. So vanity means breath. Remember what the Hebrew word is? Abel. Abel. So you think it's hebel, but in English we would pronounce Abel. So that son of Adam and Eve, Abel, that's the word. Abel is breath. So um, it seems to be an important play on words that um, God, I'm sorry, Eve named her son Abel, meaning breath, because there's a prophecy that they're going to die soon. So he's like a breath, and Abel is like this, this picture of what life is like. When you read the story of Abel, he does everything right. He's the good guy. He does the right sacrifice. He doesn't hurt anybody, and yet he is the one that's killed unjustly. So life is like Abel. Life is a breath, and it seems unjust. So here is the question. What am I going to do under the sun? God's in control, and life is a breath. What am I going to do with my life now? So, on the one hand, you could think, uh, if, if God's really in control, and he can do whatever he wants, and my life is a breath, and I'm going to die, and there's going to be injustice in this world because it's not heaven yet, why don't I just give up? Right? Life is absurd. Just give up. Does that, could, could, could a person make that, that argument? Oh, well, sure, lots of people do. That's, that's a big part of philosophy. You know what? If I can't change the world, then I'm just going to give up. But that's not the direction he goes. What is he going to? Where, where is he going to go in the text? You remember? What, what's, what, what is his... What is his Conclusion. It said several times, sorry, we made a kind of a big deal out of it. Anybody remember? Right. Right. Good. Right. That's that's a big part of it. You have something else? Enjoy. Well let's let's go to the text here. This this is what he says. Remember these six, seven times, it says, Behold, this is what I've seen to be good and fitting, is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun, the few days of his life that God has given him, for this is his lot. It said over and over again. Now, that's not a depressing thought to Solomon at all. He has understood that if I try to seek out meaning on my own, I try to get pleasure. I try to make a name for myself. It's going to fail. But when I put God back on his throne, God is the one who's doing what he wants to do, and he has given things to people. He's given them a certain number of days. He's given them their food. He's given them their work, and he's given them wisdom. Now I'm accountable to God for how I use these things. And one of the things that God has said is, I have given you these days, and I've given you this food, and I have given you this work. That totally changes how I treat a gift that's given to me. So, even though Solomon doesn't use this word, he is like a steward now. He is like a steward. God has said, here is your life, here is the wisdom I've given you, and I'm also giving you the ability to enjoy. I don't give that ability to everybody. Use the gift. So now you can look back and say, oh, what are the commands, in a sense, that are just told us through the book of Ecclesiastes, here's a command, enjoy your life. Enjoy the food I've given you. Enjoy the work I've given you. Enjoy these things I've given you. And we saw as we worked our way through the book of Ecclesiastes how this, this changes everything because if I am given this work from God and I'm told to enjoy this work, it eliminates me trying to get another person's work. It eliminates this envy thing because I'm not, I own God. God is the one who has said, this is yours. And he does the same with wisdom, and he does the same with all the good gifts that we have been given. So Ecclesiastes 
the, this preacher, the Solomon, is, a, is a, a teacher ultimately of joy. He is saying, God is the one you must fear. And that's not something that should make you sad. It's something that should make you joyful. Because he is the one in control. You don't need to be your own God. You don't need to be the one in control. You can't be the one in control. Instead, you accept from his hand what he has given you as a good gift. Um, I didn't put it in here, but I, I drew a picture at one point of, um, of a fence. And I put joy in the middle there. And God has done that. He, in a sense, has put a fence around joy, saying, you are to seek joy. I have made this for you. Seek that joy, but only in those parameters. And once you start to go out of those parameters, that's not fearing God, not keeping his commandments, and those secret things or visible things are going to fall into judgment. So God knows what he's about. We don't. Um, there, there is so much mystery to the way God is working, and you will probably disagree with what God's doing right now. So are you going to now trust him in his ways, even though you don't understand it? Or are you going to say it's not right? Now, let's go to the end of Ecclesiastes again and think about this. The words of the wise. So he, as I said in the preview video, I pointed out how Solomon is wise. He's wise, he's careful. He's arranging all these things with great care. Now, now we're told the words of the wise, like this book of Solomon, Ecclesiastes, are like goads and like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd. My son, beware of anything beyond these, of making many books there is no end, and much study is a weariness to the flesh. So, the wise words. This book of Ecclesiastes is to be like a goad and like a nail to you. And a goad, I was going to have Robert bring a cattle prod. Do you have a cattle prod, Robert? <laughs> so, a, go, a goad now probably has an electric charge at the end, doesn't it? But in the ancient world, they didn't have that, and so they just had a long stick, maybe seven, eight foot long, with a tip at the end, metal if they could get it. Now, why do you want that? It's because you've got your ox or your mule or your donkey or whatever you've got pulling you, and you're standing behind on the plow or the threshing sledge or whatever, and the, the animal is six, seven feet in front of you. Now, I have never um, used an ox or a, or a donkey or anything like that to plow, but I suspect at some point they don't want to do what you want them to do. That's, that's what I suspect. It seems to me that it takes a lot of skill as a herdsman or as a shepherd to make an animal do what you want it to do. So you've got this massive ox or this donkey, and the donkey is supposed to be going on that straight furrow, and it does it for a while until it decides it doesn't want to do it. At that point, what do you need to do if you're a shepherd? Little poke, little poke. It motivates because an ox doesn't want to go that direction at all. Now, I, I think the, the shepherd or the ox herder could say something. They could walk up to the front of the ox and say, now, um, we've only got an acre to do here, my fellow. That means it's about 27 rounds back and forth here, and then you'll get to rest. You got that? Okay. Let's go. Will the ox go? No. Can uh, Go back to the ox. Now, ox, don't you realize that we're putting seed in the ground after we plow this, and that will grow up to be grain that we will share with you um, all winter long. So you want to eat, you need to plow. Hmm? Come back. Let's go. Will the ox go? No, of course not. The ox doesn't understand that kind of stuff. He has said there's a parallel between an animal and us people. God knows what he's about. He's got a plan. He sees the future. He's got a system, and it makes perfect sense to God because he knows what he's about. You do not understand it. In fact, I think Solomon would say it's because you couldn't understand it. It's too big. It's too big. I don't even understand how my smartphone works. Could I understand how God's running the world? I don't. No, I couldn't. I, if God could explain it to me, it would make about as much sense as me explaining to an ox why he should go through the hard effort of going back and forth and back and forth. So 
the words of the wise, this Ecclesiastes is like a goad for you because you're not naturally going to want it. It doesn't naturally make sense to you. God is in control. So now, keep working. I don't want to work. <laughs> Poke! I'm, God says, but I'm in control, and these are like goads poking you. Why do they need to poke you? It's so that you keep moving even when you don't want to. So that's how the text can be an encouragement to you. Like when you go through things and you're like, I, I don't like the way God is running the world right now. I, I, I'm all for dictators, but we need a new dictator. And it should be me because I know better. Remember, my father used to tell me that was wise words. Dad would say, I'm all for dictators as long as I'm the dictator. And it was a truth that stuck with me because I realized at that point how we all think we're right in our own eyes. And every, we all do this. And whenever we see something happening in the world like, I wouldn't do it that way, we're arguing with God's secret masterful plan. And we need a poke that reminds us, no, that's not your place. You're not here as an ox figuring out how to run the world. You're to be plowing. Enjoy the job God's, God has given you. And he has told us these things. You don't understand it all, but we really do need a poke in that direction. And the second thing is, um, it, the words of the wise are like nails firmly fixed. Um, so this is, the, this is literally a nail. So the only other time a word like, similar to this is used in the Bible is like when they're nailing up the big doors on the temple. So these, these are nails. Think spikes. Think nails. Or like big tent peg or something like that a shepherd would use. Now, if I took a big nail and I pounded it in to a block or tree or a block of wood, is it going anywhere easily? Of course not. And so the words of the wise are like a nail firmly fixed. You need something that's not going to move. So in our life, as we go through our year and we're wondering what God is doing, why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to the loved one? Why didn't this happen? Why did I get the short end of the stick? Why did the good thing happen to me? Why did it happen here? We need a nail firmly fixed that we can go back to and say, I don't understand what God is doing, but he has said he knows what he's about. I'm to be fearing him, not these circumstances. I'm not to be going off in my own direction. I need, I need a truth that I can latch onto and say, I only need to fear the one who knows what he's about. I don't need to figure this one out. I need to hold on to this. So we need a poke when we need to get moving and we need something to anchor onto. And it's given by one shepherd. So Solomon, the author here, has searched this out. He's carefully compiled this. We know by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now given it to us so that we might be poked because it's easy for us to start to think we know how God ought to do things. And Ecclesiastes is given to us in parts so that we might go, but I really don't understand everything. I really don't. And that's okay, that's my place. God has revealed even more to me in the New Testament, but still, do you know what he's going to do this year? Do you have any idea other than general things like he's working to make people more in his likeness, he's saving people. You know, you know generalities, but you know no specifics. I know no specifics. But God does. He knows what he's about. And so when something happens that surprises us or concerns us or whatever, we can put our hand around that handle, that nail, and go, but I know God knows what he's about. My part right here is to trust him, to work with the work he has given me, to enjoy the work he has given me, and to trust him. That's my place. I'm not God. God knows what he's about. So, last thing before we end here. Um, I do want to encourage you by going through this text that it says the words of the wise are like goads, like nails firmly fixed. All these things are things that you and I need to study and remember. The preacher was one who carefully weighed, carefully studied, and carefully arranged these Proverbs. Uh, I am confused by a lot of what he says here. But enough details are given to encourage you to think, 
to encourage you to study. And that's what we try to do together on a, on a week-to-week basis here at our church. Um, when we give you these life group notes, I'm, I want to encourage you again, part, part of this is so that you're spending more time than just on a Sunday morning. Because if you only are thinking about this for the 20, 30, some minutes that I'm talking or Ryan's talking, it's going gonna, it's gonna to sink a little deep and then it's quickly going to go away. So we believe that you learn more as you put effort into it. So how do we want you to put effort into it? Well, you start by reading the passage. Take that passage that we're going to do. Next week, we're going to start on six weeks in the book of Psalms. So Psalm 36, start reading it. Read that passage at least five times this week or listen to it. Um, we and the Falcons like to listen to other translations that can help you bring some variety there, but you're doing it five times, looking at those five questions in here. Sometime Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, there's a preview video that comes out where Ryan or I have tried to summarize some thoughts. Um, watch it once, yes. Um, I try to watch it three or four times with the family. Get some mileage out of this thing, okay? It helps to think through it a few times, thinking through. Um, sometimes we'll start pausing it halfway through. What did, what did Tom miss? What did Ryan miss? What other observations did you make? Use it as a thing to help you process. Then you're coming here, you're thinking through this thing, you've done your digging deeper, which remember, always in here, there's a small assignment that says, okay, like Psalm 36 next week, um, should take you 10, 15 minutes to go through there and start thinking through the text on your own. So by the time you get here, you've thought through it an hour or more, and now you've listened, and then we'll go, and you'll be part of a life group or in your family, or just yourself looking through the questions that we've written, just to make you think through it again. And the hope is that if you've done that, you've spent a couple hours on a text, we not only can be talking to each other about it, but it's working its way into you somehow. There's no, there's no substitute for spending time in it. There's just none whatsoever. Um, memorizing the passages that we assign, um, those are another way to start meditating and thinking about it. I just want to encourage you again, I know it's hard, and it's something that you can say, well, I do my own little thing. Yes, I'm glad you do. Add this. <laughs> Add this. Okay. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, um, and for this book of Ecclesiastes. And even though there are many a question we have, these are all questions where we say, your will be done. Lord, this year is in your hands. This year, you will accomplish your purposes. And this year will be a challenge for each of us in some ways, very difficult challenges for some of us, and marvelous things will happen for others. And we don't know any of that, but you do. And so I ask, Father, that you would give us a humble heart that when things happen that are hard for us, we come back to a truth that you know what you're about. None of the disciples understood at the time why the Savior needed to die as he did, and yet you knew what you were about. So help us, Lord. Push us when we need to be pushed, but remind us so that we do not pretend we are the one on the throne. And even we who know better can fall into that trap. So give us, give us this truth so that we might rejoice in what you've given us and rejoice that we know you who know all things. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.